thank you so much, Maili. Well, um, I'll quickly move to you, Matteo. Um, we have about 34 minutes, and we want to have some time for Q&A as well. So, yeah. I will be, uh, be sure. Yeah, I don't know what to add in to this beautiful presentation. I would like just to respond to underline aspects of this debate. Like, for instance, um, moving from this idea that affect is not um, subjective, is something also asocial, uh, according to what Marie Louise said at the beginning. And it's precisely to me uh, what's important is the fact that the dimension of the affect, like uh, any dimension also psychopathologies, are always social. And I remember what uh, Deleuze was saying about the society of control, this division, this deconstruction of the individual into individuals. The idea that the future society of control, he wrote in 19. 90, I guess, this text called the Society of Control will be about precisely the control, not of the whole individual, but the small part of it. And we can apply this also to the economy of affects today, how the way our um, general um, uh, affection, affect, uh, economy of affects is completely um, deconstructed in atoms, so to speak. The most basic example is, for instance, is the like uh, button in Facebook. So it's how it's become part of our, um, yeah, atomic uh, um, economy. Uh, there is this movie by um, Spike Jones here that probably um, you know because it's about this hipster that fell in love with the artificial intelligence, very famous novel. But at the same time, I don't like that movie because it does not address the dimension of social construction of affects today. It's precisely this one-to-one -one relation. But to me, for instance, social networks are one of the best example of the general management, of the global management of affect and of the affect economy. So we could, I, I like to define a social network like Facebook and many others like augmented affective intelligence. And uh, I will go back to this uh, notion. And uh, for me, like I tried to, to do uh, two days ago in, in my speech, uh, for me it's interesting to understand where and how the algorithm intervene. Where is this threshold between you know, our body, our uh, visceral materiality of affects, and the algorithm, the computational dimension? Where is the point of conjunction? How this, this, this two domain, from different point of view, politically, philosophically, they, they start to, to interact. And this is also uh, the same problem that Foucault had, because uh, we have to go probably beyond the Foucauldian studies of today. We have to invent new form of Foucauldian analysis of this. That Foucault had this idea precisely of to find the relation between the domain of, uh, of knowledge and the domain of power, the domain, the regimes of enunciation and the regime of visibility. That is also at the same time the regime of rationality and the regime of power. And today that kind of, uh, um, Episteme that Foucault was like uh, investigating has been verticalized through computation at very high vertigo of reason and logic. So still for me it's to understand how, and this um, for me in effective computing it's uh, interesting, but also in any biometric example that Pina uh, brought is this idea how precisely all these algorithms they work on the recognition, reconstruction and measurement of common patterns of any level. It could be the patterns of the face, but also pattern of your uh, daily metabolism. And still is this idea of a pattern recognition of a norm and how affects they precisely are defined by moving from that specific, uh, to, from the specific norm. But here precisely is still the mathematical threshold, how, how our body is transformed in a formula and so on. So um, usually affect and reason are separated and I prefer to frame both affect and reason as a result of our continuous conflict antagonism with the environment, our umwelt and uh, even our beloved us is always for me the effective, effective economy, economy of our uh, body as much as our brain reason is something that is produced by a continuous tension. In the same way, I, I believe that technologies today, social network, but also this new form of technology for which they're developing um, commercial uh, technique, are precisely uh, tapping into our openness to the world, our curiosity, our tension. So, um, yeah, social networks are like uh, somehow absorbing our curiosity for the world, but at the same time we are using networks, uh, augmented form of uh, intelligence, as a projection of our curiosity, of our antagonism uh, towards the world. That's the reason why I like to, to work, and I will work next, actually, next month on, 
on the project of this ontology, on this idea of uh, augmented intelligence and um, augmented affective intelligence. And the idea that also, um, f for me, is crucial how affects, at, at, in the definition of affects, in the definition of our uh, libido and desire and so on, we should put um, the idea of trauma, the idea of constant trauma of our body, brain, uh, um, against the environment. So the idea also of the catastrophe that must be uh, crucial. And uh, Pinner mentioned this uh, canonical case study of the um, Phoenix cage brain uh, damage, but the whole history uh, of neurology also, if we move even back to the neurology here in Berlin uh, a century ago, the Gestalt School, and even specifically people like Kurt Goldstein or von Monakov, they were already investigated the centrality of uh, the trauma in the ability of the brain to um, yeah, regulate uh, dealing with the, with the war, but also, yeah, regulate its own affect. And for me, I, I conclude here, because uh, Pina was mentioning Damasio, that uh, wrote a crucial book, uh, and Damasio has been um, influenced a lot by um, holistic paradigm about the brain, uh, um, brain mind, uh, the brain body relation, the body mind relation. But uh, it's interesting how precisely, this is a real uh, crucial uh, point for me. For me, it's uh, to uh, articulate this relation between affect uh, and cognition today. And how specifically, if we take like French philosophy, all these philosophers like Deleuze and Guattari, their idea of desiring machine, their paradigm, has been, uh, for me, very weak, a bit weak in, the, in forecasting, in uh, uh, understand what uh, all this technology have become nowadays, precisely a technology of intelligence, but technology of an augmented cognition. So um, how the, the issue, precisely, of cognition return in the definition of after? For me, the two things go together. And uh, we could read the Masters book also in the fact that um, all the time we develop new affects, all the time we change our affects, we, we, have, we need the contribution of our uh, of our mind, of our cognition of the world, or our power of abstraction. So that's for me is also interesting in the definition of uh, our emotion, the basic uh, love that Spinoza put at uh, the development no, of, um, of his conatus, is the fact that uh, abstraction return in our ability to uh, invent also new affects. Maybe. And this is to me connected to the whole intelligence and technologies that nowadays we use in this field. Thank you so much. Okay, holding the microphone and clapping to be at the same time is not a good idea. So, um, uh, considering the time uh, constraints, I'll open the discussion up to the audience. And I'm wondering if audience members have any questions. Um, for our speakers, if not, I of course have some questions to you both, but when I first give the right to the audience. Yeah. Do you do you have access to a microphone so that we can all hear you? Um, with these uh, heat maps and stuff uh, to tracking the emotional state of the, the body and the affection and stuff like that, um, has there been any research into if you can trick your body into feeling other emotions by changing your heat signature uh, in any ways like that? Uh, like the same way you can, uh, if you smile more, then you can trick yourself to become, uh, feel a little more happy and stuff like that. Um, can you do that, uh, or has there been research into if you can trick your body uh, more with these, uh, this knowledge? Do you want to answer? <laughs> do you? Is it a question for me? Uh, okay. General question uh, um, for you. All right. Um, all. Um, I, I'm not the researcher who did this study, but um, of course, if. Um, if uh, the way uh, our bodies, if, if uh, we could decipher the way our bodies generate heat or the, the body temperature change just um, under certain emotions, it must be possible to modify the body to, you know, create some emotions as well. But again, um, as 
we look at the, all these emotion theories, for instance, the James Lang theory and the Canon Bar theory, who are kind of opposing views, opposing views although there are parallelisms. Um, it's, uh, it's not as simple. And one, uh, one thing about uh, James Lang, Lang theory and also the fall of this theory is that um, they propose that the body feels something, and the body has, is in a condition like the heart rate raises, so the, body, uh, so the brain decides, okay, um, this is the context I'm in, there's a bear in front of me, and my heart is racing, so therefore I'm afraid. Or my heart is racing, I'm in a bridge, somebody's asking me a question, Therefore, I must be excited about this, you know, mate, potential mate, etc. So this was the, this was the premise. But when um, researchers uh, gave, uh, th th there was some research on uh, kind of uh, the exploring the opposite, where the researchers would give the participants, um, for instance, uh, some hormones or drugs to increase the heart rate, heart rate, or like to create a certain, you know, emotional bodily state but then the participants then wouldn't report that exact emotion. So it's, it's not like, you know, a, a two-way, it's, it's not as simple. It's not like just by creating the exact sa same heat map by a, a, a bodysuit or something, we might not be able to create that exact uh, emotion. Is that an answer to your question? It's yeah, accurate. okay. Yes. Another, there was another one. Again. Yeah, First, yeah. Hi, um, thanks for that. Lots of very interesting things to think about. Um, I guess it's the first time I've ever seen this face recognition technology, and it is incredibly uh, terrifying. I'd be quite interested to see what my emotional response is to watching those advertisements might be. Um, but I, I, guess, I guess my concern is um, about the proliferation of cat and dog videos as being the okay, the lowest common denomin denominator to get an emotional response from an audience, and once once we have this data about how much uh, how cute we all think cats and dogs are, that whether we're just going to be um, bombarded by these really simplified ways of um, triggering emotions, I guess it's probably already happening, yes. and I guess I wonder about. Uh, also, the people who consent to taking part in these, this, this analysis, um, like, what was it, like 24 million people who had actively participated in, in, in that project. Um, and why, why they're doing that and what, what they get from it. you know that uh, even you know if, if uh, with, the, uh, with this whole new market of variables and people are even you know they know or this they, they they think you know yes of course you know I understand this is this is an economic thing and of, uh, but even so you know they do it uh, they wear it and they are in a way uh, 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 they think you know that knowing that their own data they know something about themselves and uh, this is a kind of you know real reliability which is uh, I mean you can just see everywhere you know that this kind of you know that the data know more they are more than I am then they know more about myself than I know about myself there's something going on in my body there's something going on in my brain there's something going on beyond of myself now I can catch it you know with this data I think you know this is a kind of a very uh, reductive uh, moment where I mean in I have not for only for no, for no reason uh, mentioned in my paper sometimes psychoanalysis and Freud and the unconscious the unconscious is something you know which you can't grasp you can't get hold of it now you know with this data you know there is a promise that you can get everything that you can get access to everything and that you know, and that you know these machines these little variables are telling you everything about your own being so you you can just you know relax that something is going on every, some some something will take over the responsibility for you so this is this kind of you know delegation that there is somebody actually uh, supporting myself and i don't have to be worried 
So I think, you know, this is also, you know, why people are so, even, you know, even they know they do it. And this is actually a very important uh, definition by Slavoj Zizek, you know, when he talks about the postmodern ideology, he says, it's not about that we don't know and, and, and therefore we do, it's exactly the opposite. We know and, but, and this is therefore we do. <coughs> Thank you for very interesting examples and, and points in all the presentations. Um, I think sort of to, to the last question, um, I think we, we've, um, we're not really giving enough thought to the agency of the people who actually engage in this self-tracking. Um, there's a Finnish researcher, Minna Rockenstein, she wrote about heart rate variability testing, which is another way of, of sensing stress, which is also a form of emotion. And, and one of her findings was particularly that the people she interviewed who she'd given the heart rate variability monitors, that they, they constantly, when they looked at their own logs, they constantly negotiated, they, they made stories, they, they, they used the information to um, somewhat to rewrite the narrative of their days, somewhat to justify it, like, look, I really was stressed out, my job is really stressful, look at that. And, and so you use mm -hmm. that data to yes, justify yes. yourself, yes. but also, um, also um, adjusting the data according to their own yeah. ideas, like saying, well, that must be a mistake because actually... So I think, I think we really need to... I mean, yes, there's all sorts of things where it, it's quite worrying the way we're sort of trusting in the data like this, but I think we need to think, be much more aware of people's agency and the way people actually negotiate with the data. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear what you think about that, but to all of you, really. For me, this is a completely new, uh, probably, uh, issue because only in the last years we developed, I mean, we had the technique of pattern recognition since decades, but only in the last year was we applied mass computation and we produced uh, so like a global profile for this. And this is a new form of uh, mathematization of normality. And the, what's interesting for me is that once a kind of norm has been established, could be a facial norm, then it produces... Uh, um, uh, side effect on the whole population. It's a new form of, uh, I don't know, we can call it biopolitics, I don't mind, but it's producing also kind of a normalization regulation of the society in which uh, the abnormal paradoxically becomes uh, very peripheric. And also this technique for uh, absorbing uh, affect controlling commercial uh, marketing things. They're just, on the long term, they're producing very weird profile. So we are just, uh, I don't know, entering a kind of uh, age of, uh, I don't know, data biometrics and abstraction of the human that I find it um, a bit uncanny. I don't know how much we can uh, negotiate when once you are within, you know, this kind of uh, biometric cage, I don't know how to define it, and how, and uh, I mean, here at the festival there's been uh, other panel about self-quantization, self-quantification uh, movement and things like that. I don't know, I've, we are just entering a new age for me. And a new also ethical issue have to debunk properly. Until Jonas, you get the mic microphone, I promise it's coming. Well, there is, a, there is this emotional appraisal theory in neuroscience. So actually um, seeing your bodily response or like consciously getting this information as a feedback is also used as a way of treatment with uh, depression pa patients or um, what is it, post-traumatic stress disorder patients or all kinds of psychological disorders, this neurofeedback and, uh, is, you know, it's, it's being explored. Yeah. I mean, you know, the thing is, you know, I'm interested, you know, when you said that we have to see, you know, how people deal or react or, you know, there is this kind of conversation with oneself all the time with, uh, in, in forms of data or images. I mean, the, kind of, the, the question is, you know, is there a difference between, you know, this kind of uh, having all the times, you know, our images around ourselves, or it is what we've seen, you know, this, this selfies. So we are producing our images. At the same time, you know, we have, of course, you know, a different self-image. Does, does this self-image be uh, affected by this data images we now get, you know, more and more, you know, this kind of, if I have, you know, the, the watch, you know, from Apple and, you know, I can always see, you know, the, my pulse or my heartbeat or my, and so on, and so does, does it, you know, 
rendered my self-image or tells me a different story about myself, I don't know yet, you know. This is, as you know, Matteo said, we are sort of, you know, en entering, you know, this new mm -hmm. uh, well, algorithmic uh, self-image. Yeah, just uh, a comment. One era. of the issues for me is like, this is just developing a sort of flat uh, psychiatry and flat psychology that actually is like obliterating the role that excess, surplus, abnormality also uh, have in our daily metabolism. And this is also one of the uh, crucial uh, intuition behind the idea of neuroplasticity, is the fact that uh, our brain doesn't function the same way every day. We continuously um, uh, produce new ideas, and also the brain is sometimes able to produce little catastrophe, little trauma to improve in itself or to invent new things or discover new things. And this is sort of, yeah, flat biometricism that is like completely removing the abnormal in any form from psychology to metabolism, to speak. Get the microphone. Thank you. Um, fantastic presentations. Um, let's see, I mean, there is an overarching uh, heavy critique here, which is very important. And the, I mean, watching these videos that are uh, wonderfully cynical in their <laughs> presentation of what they're trying to do, uh, but at the same time, I, I can't help but having a small piece of a techno utopian inside of me, and I was wondering if you would like to also play a bit of devil's uh, advocate, uh, since I mean, we see like. How, where, how this is funded, what's, what the aim is, uh, we see the negative side effects, but at the same time, it must be the case that we are learning something new that can be uh, used, can be appropriated, can be uh, determined somehow. So. Yeah, this is for me is connected to the, to the previous question. It's precisely uh, any time we, we uh, attempt to map affects uh, or we develop new technology, immediately we have the, the conscious uh, idea, the self, the way to use it self-consciously, or to try immediately to tap into this uh, form of, uh, to manipulate the variables, like the idea that you can manipulate our body uh, with medicines, drugs, uh, any form of technology. So this is precisely related to the issue of augmentation of our self. And specifically, yes, we learn something, and but the, the it's, somehow the way we develop the critic of all this kind of corporate approach to the effect. But for me, the, also the issue is this. Yeah, we measure the effect, we, we try to uh, tap into the um, uh, mechanism of uh, effects, but at the same time, this is something we can immediately, consciously, uh, through our reason, uh, maybe attempt to manipulate or to, just to play it maybe, just to play with it. Um, okay, um, that question and then your question. Okay, Okay. Uh, just a, a, a follow-up actually to what Jonas said as, as well. Um, I, think, I think data does have, I mean the reliance on data and the increase in quantification really does have a danger in it that we may lose some of, you know, our ideas of self, humanity, intuition, all these humanistic things, but I think the general um, vibe at Transmedial is taking it too far in the like data is dangerous um, direction and I think we definitely need to keep that but it's almost like in our critique of data we forget that data is representation data there is no such thing as raw data I, was it Lisa Gittleman wrote the book raw data is an oxymoron um, and we keep talking about obviously the, the marketing presents it as if this is the truth but we know it's not the truth and I think that <laughs> if we think the people using it that the people in the quantified self movement I think they under we should at least allow for the possibility that they also understand that it's not truth it's representation so I would say can I just you know add something you know of the positive thing is you know that uh, 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 the, the psychology has been dominated uh, or, or neuroscience research, brain research has been dominated for many, many decades by, you know, this cognition thing. Now today, you know, we can just, you know, see that even, you know, in uh, this research, you know, affect has become, uh, is getting more and more uh, sensual and uh, and they tell and the researchers are telling us you know that it's not everything about cognition cognition is not the whole issue it's more about affects affects actually 
uh, which are located in the subcortex or wheresoever, you know. So there's a kind of interesting mixing. And then one has, of course, you know, to ask oneself, you know, what does it mean? You know, if its cognition has, you know, to be, is, is getting together with affect or, you know, cognition actually is uh, said to be effective, you know, does it, you know, does it, uh, does it uh, bring something new about it or uh, does it change anything or what the, actually, what are the results, what are the consequences out of this, you know. So there's an interesting, and that, as I said, you know, in my paper, there's an interesting crossing, you know, in this affect discourse uh, uh, at the moment uh, uh, where, you know, I, would, I wouldn't say, you know, only, I wouldn't see it only in a negative way, but see it in a, in a, in a, to be cautious, you know, and to see, you know, in which ways, you know, these researches are driven, you know, and by what forces they actually, what interests they are driven. Yeah, I'm um, oh, sorry. Is, you, is there time for another question? Or? Wait, where is the microphone? Uh, we we uh, had another, <laughs> you had a question. Yeah, so let, I'll, let me. I'll pass it on then. Yeah, and then you have a question, and we have like five minutes. How are we going to do this? Because I saw your hand first, I think maybe you should ask your question. Yeah. Thank you, uh, and thank you for many interesting thoughts. Um, this might be a really kind of uh, obvious point, but when you see these kind of boxes, like uh, the test you were taking about how you're sad when you see a puppy crying and whatever, um, then it, it seems really obvious that there are a lot of boxes that are left out, right? Uh, like these kind of more ambiguous feelings and I mean of course some, yeah. a lot of times we don't actually know what we feel right. So what is the consequence of kind of enforcing these uh, like quantifying feelings in this sense? I'm just thinking of course it works for ads but if we are thinking about something like effective computing which I don't know too much about but I'm just thinking like what is the consequence of kind of leaving all that out? I mean is it like Facebook where you have you know relationship status where you have like it's complicated and you just chuck everything into that? Is it like <laughs> okay I've got complicated <laughs> feelings, that's fine? <laughs> or can you, I don't know like what is your thoughts on this? Um, well I just want to make a remark, it's t the big question, we don't, I don't have time to answer it fully but the, these, all these companies are based on Ekman's method of uh, recognizing emotion and what Ekman successfully achieved is the standardization of the face. So he took Darwin's idea of these universal emotions because before Darwin it was thought that you know I might be making this face and this is like me smiling in, in the context of Berlin but if I go to Kuala Lumpur this could be me crying, right? But what they said that no, we all share this you know, primates have this, so there are certain muscles, certain responses when we are, you know, uh, experiencing certain emotions. So Ekman took this and created almost uh, more than 200 different facial expressions, so made a database of faces which is re easily applicable to computing. So this is one model that's now uh, leading the, leading the uh, field towards emotion recognition. But, uh, for instance, there's body heat maps, there are other, you know, uh, ways to uh, tell what a person is feeling or experiencing. But Ekman is only one of them, and he's been successful also as a business person, as an entrepreneur. So we have to see this, right? Um, okay, since I'm the moderator, I'll stop myself, and maybe, <laughs> maybe one last question, and then um, we'll, we'll end this uh, session. I'll be extremely yeah. brief. Um, okay. I just wanted to um, probably criticize the term effective surveillance. Uh, it seems to me that it's, it's just a synonym for um, empathy and, and, uh, and a com computational. It's, it's like subliminally in, in the choice of word, you're uh, suggesting that you don't really want to call it empathy because it's computers being empathetic. So I guess my, my, my question was, is. Um, does this potentially change our relationships with computers and with technology? Um, it's, um, it's the same way that we've perhaps developed our um, understanding of animals being empathetic beings from being, being sort of non-human and being sort of elevated ourselves be above uh, the animal kingdom. Uh, we're doing the same thing by, by um, understanding computers as um, non empathetic and if we, as we are giving computers and giving technology uh, empathetic and potentially sympathetic capabilities, 
Um, will that affect our relationship with technology? Yes, definitely, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a Mac? Um, well, yeah, I'm really happy yeah. one. Well, I can bring remember it. this, like, 2004, my first Mac, and I'm playing with it, and he or she says, isn't it nice to have a computer that could talk to you? And I remember, <laughs> like, really, really liking it, so... Yeah. <laughs> but... Yeah, it's it's like Toy Story. Like, if if your computer can cry when you punish it, it, it perhaps if uh, challenges the. Um, yeah, we, we all want to, you know, we all want to be friends. We, well, we can't pages. we can't treat them as slaves anymore potentially, but. Yeah, but then of course you know the question still you know is is left you know if the the, the computer is getting empathetic, what does it actually mean? The com the computer is still calculating, and yeah. the calculation you know means you know that the emp the empathy has to be. Hmm? Yeah. You know, made pos You know, it yeah. has to be. Uh, but you don't think our our emotions are algorithmic or calculated? That's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. you know, that there's a vice versa yeah. uh, thing situation. You know. I mean, in the empathy debate, precisely there are two main uh, positions. That is, uh, is empathy something a primordial, can, something like coded into our bones and flesh, or is something we produce? Uh, after, you know, when we have experience, where we recognize the other is something similar to us. But yeah, the real issue is when empathy can be computed, what does it mean that? I mean, we, we, we enter this sort of uh, yeah. expanded idea of uh, affects, emotion, and also of empathy. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, also, you mentioned her, and um, remember, like, that was, you know, ultimate kind of utopian situation. You're falling in love with this uh, AI. And then he, there's a moment where he recognizes that she's not only in love with him, but she's talking to like 100, like he asks how many other lovers do you have? And it's like 100,648 or something. So can, yes, you can be friends, you're like empathetical beings, you two having a good time, but can you trust your friends? <laughs> yeah, um, I have to, end this session and thank you so much for um, coming and sharing your thoughts and thank you so much Matteo and Marie-Louis.